Chemistry, National Institute of Technology, Raurkila. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to this beautiful and lush green campus encircling an immense diversity, both in terms of ethnicity and intellectual interests. I, Jigyansa Sahu, and I, Pratiksha Das Patnaik, honorably welcome you all to the first day of the 31st CRSI National Symposium in Chemistry. We would like to take this opportunity to thank Chemical Research Society of India for giving us the opportunity to host this gracious event at our institute. Established with a vision to foster excellence in chemical research and promote scientific advancements, CRSI has emerged as a lighthouse of knowledge, creativity and innovation, illuminating the path of young and bright minds. Well, Albert Einstein once said, if we know what it was we were doing, it would not be called research, would it? It is on occasions like this that we get the opportunity to test our knowledge and understanding. We are hopeful that this platform will be able to achieve its objective of providing an effective forum for academicians, researchers, sponsors and industry personnel to advance in knowledge, research and technology. We look forward to getting exposure about what the best of the brains have to think about the leading topics of research in chemistry. Now, Without any further ado, I would like to request all the honorable dignitaries to kindly grace the dais. Now, if I may request the president of CRSI, Professor Uday Metra, to kindly occupy the chairs on dais. I request the volunteers for a huge round of applause. Now, I would like to request the honorable director of NIT Raurkela, Professor K. Umameshwar Rao, to kindly occupy the chair on the dais. Please, sir. Now I would like to request Senior Associate Director, Global Strategy for Society Programs, ACS International India, Mr. Rajesh Parishwad, the Secretary General of CRSI, Professor N. Jairaman, Chairman Professor Priyabrata Das, and the Convener, Professor Rupam Dinda, to kindly occupy their chairs on the dais. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Now let us welcome our esteemed dignitaries by felicitating them with a bouquet of flowers and a huge round of applause. I request the student volunteers to kindly do the honor. I request the audience for a huge round of applause. Thank you, volunteers. We shall now move on to a traditional lamp lighting ceremony to pay our tributes to the goddess of knowledge, Asato Ma Sad Gamaya, Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya, praying to the Almighty to lead us from the unreal to the real, from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge. Now, I would like to request our dignitaries of the dais to kindly light the lamp and commence a successful opening to the conference. Please, sir. Namaste. 
स्तुते आत्मज्योति प्रदीप्ताया ब्रह्मज्योति नमोस्तुते ब्रह्मज्योति प्रदीप्ताया गुरुज्योति नमोस्तुते गुरुज्योति नमोस्तुते गुरुज्योति नमोस्तुते गुरुज्योति नमोस्तुते गुरुज्योति नमोस्तुते थैंक यू I would like to request the convener, Professor Rupam Dinta, to kindly deliver the welcome address to the gathering. Very good morning to all. Professor Uday Maitra, President, Chemical Research Society of India. Professor K. Uma Mohistar Rao. Honorable Director of NIT Raurkela, Officer N. Jairaman, Secretary General of CRSI, Dr. Rajesh Pariswad, Senior Associate Director, Global Strategy for Societal Program, ACS International India, Officer P. Das, HOD Chemistry, NIT Raurkela, Esteemed Past Presidents of CRSI, and CRSI governing body and council member who were present in this meeting today, Honorable Director of few of the renowned academic and research institutions of our country, especially the institution from the state of Odisha, who are present in this meeting today, scientists, researchers, speakers, session chairs, student delegates, delegates from industry, delegates from publication houses, the deans, registered, HODs, faculty colleagues and staff members of NIT Rourkela and my dear students, on behalf of the organizing committee, it is, Im it is my immense honor to welcome you all to the 31st CRSI National Symposium in Chemistry and CRSI SES Symposium Series in Chemistry, the largest chemistry conference of our country under the auspices of CRSI at Department of Chemistry, NIT Rourkela. The Chemical Research Society of India, CRSI, was established in the year of 1999 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of independence by the founder president, Bharat Atna Professor CNR Rao. The more details of the CRSI and its annual meeting will be highlighted by Professor Jayaraman. It is noteworthy to mention that ACS International India of American Chemical Society is the active partner and prime sponsor of this meeting. And uh, Dr. Rajesh Pariswad will highlight about uh, ACS International India and its collaboration with CRSI. CRSI NSC 31 aims to cover wide range of topics in the different discipline of chemistry. In this two and a half day meeting, we have the lectures mostly on CRSI award lectures. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to congratulate all the recipient of CRSI medal who are going to present their lecture in this meeting today. Also in this meeting, we'll have more than 200 poster presentations divided into two days of the event and around 400 delegates will participate in the meeting. I am excited to announce that CRSI NSC 31 host 30 poster awards from 15 renowned and very well-known SES journals sponsored by SES International and India. And each of uh, prize will come up with a cash prize of 3,000 cash with a certificate from CRSI and SES. I am also happy to announce that maybe for the first time in a CRSI meeting, 
we are going to have a designated autograph zone where the delegates can put their views with the autographs and a designated selfie point where the delegates can take their snaps and enjoy the event. I sincerely thank the CRSI governing body and council, the present body headed by Professor Maitra and the former council the headed by former immediate president Professor V.K. Singh and Secretary General Professor Jairaman for giving us the opportunity to host this prestigious CRSI annual meeting in our institute. I sincerely thank to all the speakers and session chairs to accept our invitations and present in this meeting today. On behalf of the organ organizing committee, I also extend our deepest gratitude to our Honorable Director Professor Rao for his time, his kind support and inspirations. I also would acknowledge and would express my sincere thank to the support provided by the administration of NIT Raurkela for the smooth organization of this meeting. On the top of it all, I the convener, my chairman, the co-conveners, the organizing committee, all the student volunteers have been trying our best for a year to provide you all with the support of local travel, accommodation, venue, food and other services. But still we won't have control over all the things, especially the weather and the communication to reach our campus. Hence I request you all to cooperate and bear with us. Certainly feel free to let us know if you feel, if you have anything you need to, to our help decks outside, we are there to help you to, to make your stay enjoyable. Finally, we invite each of you to share your expertise, contribute your unique talents to the CRSI NSC 31, and enjoy these two and a half days and gain a lot of insights. Let's begin to start this amazing journey together. Thank you again. Thank you, sir, for your welcoming words. Now I would like to request the chairperson, Professor Priyabrata Das, HOD Chemistry, to kindly address today's gathering. A respected Director, sir, Professor K. Umameswar Rao, a respected President, CRSI Professor Uday Maitra, respected General Secretary, CRSI Professor N. Jairaman, Honorable Senior Associate Director, Global and Strategy for Society Program, SES, Mr. Rajesh Parishad, respected dignitaries and dear participants, press people, faculties from different departments of our institute, and ladies and gentlemen. First of all, a very good morning to all of you. On behalf of the Department of Chemistry at NIT Raulkela, I welcome you all to this prestigious 31st CRSA National Symposium in Chemistry. Before I delve into details about my department, I take this opportunity to thank our director, sir, who despite his busy schedule, has graced this occasion and motivated us. During this last six to eight months, he has helped us a lot for execution of this conference. I must thank, sir, for your help. The Department of Chemistry is one of the earliest departments to be established by NIT Rahul Kala back in 1961. With all the support from the administrations, we have moved and become a fully functional department having 20 faculties, seven supporting staffs, around 100 PhD students, and around 170 undergraduate and PhD uh, graduate students. We offer programs related to MSc, Intermediate MSc, and PhD degrees. We are committed to providing undergraduate and graduate students with quality education and training while pushing the frontiers of knowledge through cutting edge research. Since the heart of every department is its students, let's begin by exploring our graduate and undergraduate programs. Our graduate program provides opportunities to students in a wide array of chemical disciplines. You name it, we have all the disciplines available in our department along with the freedom to personalize their courses and research project. 
The students also have many opportunities for professional development, including communication, networking, and outreach program. Because of such things, our students have been placed in reputed universities as postdoctoral fellow, lecturers, and assistant professors in government institutes, and in national laboratories, as well as private companies. Our undergraduate program offers an innovative curriculum that provides students with outstanding training for a variety of career path. We offer customized academic planning, advising, and research opportunities. The latter is especially important, wherein the students have the chance to work with the faculties and cutting edge problems and gain skills that transfer to professional development as well as co-author papers with them. This has become quite enthralling after the introduction of National Education Policy 2020 in our institute. With the commendable effort by our director, sir, and the NEP team, I'm happy to share that from this semester onwards, we are going to implement NEP 2020 in our undergraduate curriculum. The department takes immense pride in its faculties, involved in diverse and high-quality research. Funded by all the reputed funding agencies of the country, they are leaders in their field and, have, and numerous awards to their names for their scientific contributions. Be it organizing meetings like this, outreach initiatives, or innovative teaching method, you name it, our faculties are committed to deliver it. The department also have facilities for high-end instruments, along with a fully functional central instrumentation facility within the campus. I sincerely hope that our department will be welcoming and inclusive place for all of you who seek intellectual elevation. Well, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. To know where to find the information and how to use it, well, that's the secret of success. So I welcome you all to witness this incredible knowledge and open your doors to success through this 31st year as a national symposium. And I hope that you will have a memorable experience in these three days. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to request the patron of this conference, our Honorable Director, sir, Professor K. Umameshwar Rao, to kindly address the gathering. The most distinguished dignitaries on us. Professor Uday Maitra, President CRSI, Professor Jay Raman, General Secretary CRSI, Mr. Rajesh, Senior Associate Director, Global Strategy for Society Programs, and many other dignitaries of the DAS, delegates across the country, ladies and gentlemen, and my dearest students, it gives me, a, it's, a, it's a feeling of a pride and, and privilege for hosting this 31st Chemical Research Society of India's conclave, the National Symposium in Chemistry at NIT Raurkela. The first statement which I heard as I entered into this seminar hall, one of the most distinguished delegates, a uh, dignitary, commented that your institution is no less to IIT Kharagpur or any other older IITs. It's a, a pride for all of us and we are striving, striving to be nothing less to any of the older IITs, I would say that, emphasize that one. When the galaxy of luminaries, distinguished dignitaries gather together at one place, and we make the, set the stage for that, there is always going to be a hum. That's recently, it is really said that there is a gravitational hum from the cosmos. Now we have the, the legendary distinguished, the scientists in chemistry, and then when they gather at one place, there is always a hum, and then we are really happy to have all of you here on campus. Today I have a, a press meeting I just would like to share some thoughts with you for having released our first allocation of the seat allocation of the students across the country. I am the chairman of seat allocation committee for India, for all the IITs as well as NITs, which is through JOSA, that is JE, Main and then Advanced, 
and then CSAM. We have already released first list of that one, and then today is the press meet. Why it becomes very important here is that I am talking to the scientists here. Last year also we conducted, and then this year also we are conducting. One point which I want you to understand is that something around 14 to 16 lakh students compete for JE. Out of that one, less than 10% will be succeeding in that. In that 10%, 80% of them are going to computer sciences, IT, com electronics and communication, electrical engineering. That's it. After that is the choice of the other engineering disciplines. After that is the choice of ISERs if they are also in that particular thing. The question which I'm really asking is that I want all of you to understand is that sciences are really important, basic sciences like chemistry, physics, and mathematics are the, in fact, the foundation for any engineering, foundation for any technology. Unfortunately, in today's scenario, what is really happening is that somewhere we are missing to pass the message that science is more important than engineering. If you have a scientist and then engineering can be really created by whatever the manpower that we have, but then we need to have the best brains of the country pursuing the science streams is my first question which the Times of India has given me is that only I have to answer them now today. Why there is only demand for computer sciences, all these circuit departments, engineering, and no, not sciences. So I'm still struggling to find out an answer. Okay. This is one thing which we have got to really understand that a platform like this where the scientists from across the country and abroad, when they gather to, together, apart from discussing the achievements and then discoveries and innovations that you have really made so far, another thing is that there should be a team following you, another team of young scientists following you who are going to really take forward. It's, it's, it's not a, research is not absolutely taken as a independent, in an isolated experience. It has to be in an experience, a collective experience of all, all the stakeholders there. And so in that pursuit, right, it may not be a right point to discuss, but then this is a point to be considered that there is a gap. There is a gap in the scientists which are now following you. And as far as the organization of this uh, uh, conference is concerned, NIT Rorkela is one of the oldest uh, regional, it started as a regional engineering college, and now it is with the act of parliament from 2004 on, it has become the national, the Institute of, uh, Institute of National Importance, and then we are within the top 16th rank in NIRF, and NIR ranking is also very important. And then as far as our uh, overall ranking, overall ranking also is very high, which we are just within the 50th position. Having said that one, we are also striving very hard to make it a, a global destiny for the international students to pursue their education at NIT Rorkala. NIT Rorkala is the only institution wherein we have 300 plus international students on campus. Of course, all these students are from SAR, SAR countries and near and ar around the countries. So it has a, a good legacy and it has that particular foundation which is really taking us in whichever the direction which we are moving forward. Lastly, without taking much of the time, right, I wish the students who have come here, please try to listen to every single lecture by the dignitaries here, and then their innovations and discoveries, and try to take the motivation out of that one, and then inspiration. Such platforms is only an opportunity for you to interact and have a, a sort of a relationship that is developed so that you get the uh, required motivation to pursue your the research programs. I wish everyone all the very success. And I'm really uh, taken into surprise by the color of the bag which they have selected. 
because it is the color of copper sulfide. So now it is absolutely, chemistry is there all around. Chemistry is always there all around, excepting that, that the climate out here, last year at the same time, it was not so hot and humid. Chemistry in the atmosphere is beyond our control. We cannot do anything but for that humid and a hot climate. And I think we are striving very hard to keep your stay here comfortable and memorable. Enjoy your stay here. It's a lush green campus in a silent valley in a uh, steel city. And I wish you carry lot many memories of this campus. It's the campus in the making of many scientists. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. That was a very value-adding talk. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to request the co-convener, Professor Saroj Lochan Samal, to kindly read out the message from the founder president of CRSI, Bharat Ratna, Professor Sienna Rao. Very good morning to one and all. It is my honor to read out the message of Professor Sienna Rao, Bharat Ratna, and founder of, founder president of CRSI. So his message is, CRSI is an obvious place to present the work you must cherish. I started CRSI some time ago. CRSI is now on its own. Long live CRSI. Best wishes, Sienna Rao. So on behalf of organization, uh, organizing committee, I would like to thank Professor Sienna Rao for his message. Thank you. Our deepest regards to Professor Sienna Rao. And I would also like to thank Professor Sarod Samal for sharing this message and enlightening us. Thank you, sir. I would like to request Senior Associate Director, Global Strategy for Society Programs, ACS International India, Mr. Rajesh Parishwad, to kindly address the gathering. Good morning. A warm welcome to everyone to the 31st CRSI National Symposium on behalf of the American Chemical Society. It's always a pleasure to be at the CRSI National Symposium as we can it witness the best of Indian chemical science research. And we are proud to be associated with this year's edition at the National Institute of Technology, Rokela. It is an honor and pleasure to partner with CRSI as they have been one of the important partners globally with, RS, uh, with ACS to promote chemical sciences. Although our partnership started a few years ago, we are delighted that a partnership is growing and evolving over time. Our CRSI ACS Symposia has been a, an, an unqualified success as the quality of science, the numbers speak for itself. Over 2,000 researchers have participated in the meetings and interacted with eminent scientists from India and other parts of the world. This year, we are glad to have Professor Elena Galopini from Rutgers University, who is also our founding deputy editor of ACS Applied Optical Materials Journals. We have researchers Priya Madhwan, Garima Jindal, Dr. Nilina Nemani from IIT as ACS speakers who will showcase their science. We are also excited that CRSI will be celebrating its 25th anniversary in 2024, and we are looking forward to strengthening our ties and planning many exciting activities for the future. I would, at this juncture, I would like to thank the CSI leadership, Professor Uday Maitra, Professor Vinod Singh, Professor Timurthy, Professor Saurav Pal, and Professor Jairaman, and the CRSI community for supporting this collaboration over these years. And those who are not aware or uninitiated about ACS, I would like to give a brief introduction about us, about our work in India and our future plans. We are one of the la world's largest scientific organization with more than 1.373 lakhs members across 140 countries. Founded in, 19, uh, founded in 1876 and chartered by the US Congress, our mission is to advance the broader chemistry enterprise and its practitioners for the benefit of Earth and its people. We are a leading provider of chemical sciences knowledge in the world. We have published over 60,000 research papers in 22 alone, over 80 plus journals. We have around 204 million unique chemicals in our CAS database and numerous professional skill development programs 
to support the next generation of scientists. India is emerging as a, is emerging as a hub for chemical science globally, thanks to huge investment in research. There have been a lot of investment in building new institutes, significant strengthening of research laboratories as well. And not surprisingly, we have witnessed a spurt of growth in research papers published by Indian authors over the recent years. And we are proud to be the publisher of choice in India. In fact, we published over 3,200 articles in 22 alone and have a huge presence of Indian scientists on our editorial boards. That includes Professor Kian Ganesh as co-editor-in-chief for ACS Omega. We have 28 associate editors, almost 150 plus editorial board members across our portfolio of ACS journals. Interestingly, a couple of days ago, we just announced Professor Jain Haldar from JNCR as the editor-in-chief for the ACS Infectious Disease Journal. It reflects the India's growing importance in engaging and the global scientific community. In fact, ACS journey in India has been equally exciting as well. We had set up our office around 10 years ago, uh, and since then, we have grown exponentially in our Indian operations. We have more over 150 employees spread across two offices in New Delhi and Pune, and they are supporting various activities in India and also globally. More importantly, and it's a very interesting development, India will act as a springboard for ACS international activities and serve the communities not only in, in India, but in Asia Pacific, South East, South Asia, Middle East, Africa, and Latin America regions in the coming years. In this connection, ACS has set up the Global Strategy for Society Programs Office India, which will be led by Dr. Diksha Gupta. We would, all, we would like to collaborate with CRSI and the Indian research community to engage in these regions globally. We have created an online platform, a global virtual symposium, to engage and collaborate with other researchers to host scientific meetings. And these meetings will be held along ACS national meetings in the US. I have my colleagues here, Ajay Jha and Krishna Raghwar, who can share you a little more deep, uh, information about these activities. Please, uh, he's there here, you can really talk to them as well. We are also focused on upskilling and skilling science graduates, research scholars, and early career researchers through various programs. For example, we will be soon launching Faculty Leadership Summit in association with Indian National Academy of Science to empower early career researchers, particularly assistant professors, postdoctoral fellows, and scientists. And these co cohort will be given leadership skills. We will be in imparting knowledge and skills focusing on science leadership, management, collaboration, networking, industry engagement, as well as funding matters. And for graduate and postgraduate students, we will be launching virtual internship capsule later this year. And these are designed to empower students with industry skills to enhance their resumes and also secure industrial job opportunities. The, this immersive program will equip students with skills, knowledge, and practical experience needed to stand out in the competitive job market. My colleague Krishna Raghava, who is leading this initiative, is here. Please take the opportunity to speak him at ACS booth. We have also colleagues from our publication and uh, commercial as well as uh, the chemical abstract service. Please really interact with them as well. Before I finish, I would like to thank everyone who has worked hard to make this event happen, particularly our host, Professor Rupam Dinda, and his colleague for providing fantastic support and hospitality. It has made the job easier for my colleagues in India to be part of this program. Once again, thank our partners, Professor Uday Maitra, Professor Singh, and Jai Raman for giving great support in putting this symposium together. And last but not the least, thank you all for coming. Wish you a simulating and productive symposium. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to request the Secretary General of CRSI, Professor N. J. Raman, sir, to address the audience. Professor Uma Mahishwar, Director of NIT, President Professor Udayamaitra, and 
Rajesh from RSC, Professor Das, HOD of the department, Professor Rupam Dinda, past presidents, Professor Chandrasekharan, Professor Vinod Singh, Professor Sauropal, dignitaries in the front row, esteemed colleague from ACS, uh, my dear students, students, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to all of you. So I will just take a few minutes to tell about CRSA. CRSA as an institution it was started. It is going to complete 25 years by this year. As was read out just now, that it was the brainchild of Professor CNR Rao. So just now we have heard his uh, we have heard his um, uh, note that CRSA is the place to present the chemistry research. So CRSA stands up to bring out the advancements in chemistry in all branches of chemistry. Initially it was started with a one conference a year but over a period of time it has gained strength to strength. If you go back in 1999, it started with approximately 250 to 300 members in the society, but today we have more than 4,000 members, primarily and only from India chemistry community in the country. A large number of Research activities are happening around the country in so many different institutions. Recognizing these advancements at the national level, the CRSA has taken efforts to have the conference more than once a year. Now we have a conference once in a couple of years. CRSA is also equally very active in its outreach or reach programs, particularly international conferences, international societies. Prominent among them are Royal Society of Chemistry, RSC, and ACS. So we have here with Rajesh, a lot with RSC, now with the ACS. <laughs> so we have very thick collaborations with societies and a lot of programs that are going on. In addition to it, we have collaborations with Federation of Chemists, Asian Chemists, several, several countries in and around India, and also the Commonwealth Nations. And as a result, CRSI is representing many different international fora. CRSI is also very active in many different directions. A grand example is the collaboration with Vela VCH Publication House, where CRSA is one of the founding members of three or four journals, Vela VCH journals, Chemistry Asian Journal, Chemistry uh, uh, European Journal of Organic Chemistry, Chem Nanomet, in which CRSA is one of the founding members. Regarding the meeting here, as you see that this is the 31st CRSA NSC and CRSA ACS Symposium Series. So in the last 25 years, CRSA has conducted in many different places throughout the country. And I am very glad to tell you that this is the first time a CRSI meeting is happening in NIT system. So CRSI Rurkela has taken the lead for this. And it's also important to notice that the CRSI symposium is happening in the state of Orissa or the eastern state of Orissa for the first time. So it is the grand enthusiasm of this NIT Rurkela, particularly uh, Professor Umamahish Rao and convener 
Professor Rupam Dindand, host of colleagues, having taken this enthusiasm to conduct this conference. And you see that there is a lineup of speakers from CRSA-SES, COCRSA-SES, symposium series. Few years ago, until few years ago, it, it used to be one block period in which CRSA ACS symposium used to be conducted. But now it has become part of the CS, CRSA uh, talks. And uh, now this is symposium series is combined with the CRSA NSC series. So thanks to our overseas speaker, Professor Elena, Elena Galapino, and all other speakers in ACS symposium series who will be giving the talks in this symposium. As you will go through this meeting, there is a lineup of speakers, primarily medalists, largely medalists. In addition to it, the local organizers have also come up with a mini symposium in modern trends in inorganic chemistry. Recent trends, huh? Recent trends. Recent trends in inorganic chemistry. So there is a session that is going on to happen on the last day. Very important to notice that, as Professor Dinda was mentioning, there is going to be a poster presentation, more than 200 of them over a couple of days by, by very enthusiastic students. And as Professor Dinda was mentioning, there are going to be a lot of poster prizes given by ACS, given by CRSA, given by Indian Academy of Sciences, Journal of Chemical Sciences, which is going to give a uh, poster prize, and also the Society of Chemists of Assam in the form of Professor R.K. Barua, poster prize. So there are several poster prizes. So I call upon all the students to be available at the poster sessions, discuss with the visitors coming to the poster sessions, and uh, enjoy the meeting. So finally, I would just again, on behalf of CRSI, sincere thanks to NIT Rurkela organizers for conducting this very important chemistry meeting of the country. As I mentioned, it's a grand forum where all the chemistry community comes together. So very rare forum to this. So at least at the national level here. So let me wish all of you to have a wonderful meeting, greeting, discussions, be together to enjoy and go through this meeting over a period of next two and a half days. Thank you so much. Great to hear you, sir. Thank you. Now, I would like to request the dignitaries to kindly take the seats in the audience. We'll be starting with the presidential address shortly. I'd like the volunteers to please help Maitra sir with their Now I would like to request 
Professor Uday Metra, the President of CRSI, to kindly deliver his talk to the audience. Am I audible clearly? Okay. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed an honor and privilege for me to speak to this audience as the ninth president of the Chemical Research Society of India, CRSI. Let me begin by thanking Professor K. Uma Maheshwar Rao and the entire administration Professor Rupam Dinda and the entire team of organizers to enable us to return to Odisha, beautiful Odisha and beautiful Raurkela, beautiful NIT campus after 12 years. Thank you all very much. Uh, the International Year of Chemistry IYC year uh, conference was hosted by NICER in Bhubaneswar. We are indeed very delighted to, uh, to return here. I would also like to welcome all the speakers and the poster presenters because they form the backbone of any uh, scientific meeting. The past presidents and the council members, invitees, and the guests, uh, and other participants to the 31st CRSI National Symposium of Chemistry. And uh, a special welcome to ACS India and the ACS partnership with CRSI and all the speakers who have come from the United States and from other parts of India. I think Professor Jairaman has given a broad overview about CRSI's activities and what we expect in the next uh, two and a half days. And by tradition, the CRSI president uh, gives a research talk uh, in the presidential address. So I would like to now go back to the slides. And before I give the research talk, I would like to say a few things which are relevant now in 2023, particularly for the young, uh, younger audience here, the next generation of scientists and chemists. And, but let me go back a little bit on the history. And this is the first council of CRSI. Uh, and you see that the founder president, CNR Rao, is here. I am using the Zoom because I think the screen is small and many of you are sitting in the rear, may not be able to see it. Uh, and then it turns out that uh, three members from the old council are actually present here. Uh, Professor Chandrasekharan, uh, Professor Iqbal, and myself. The second council uh, and the other councils I will very briefly illustrate here. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Professor Rao was the first president, followed by Professor Govardhan Mehta, Professor Animesh Chakrabarti, Professor V. Krishnan, Professor S. Chandrasekharan, Professor Saurabh Pal, Professor Satyamurti, Professor Vinod Singh, and finally we are here. And the color code here is that those whose names are in red, they are unable to present to be to come here whereas those who are in green are all here today i would like to share a couple of slides for the benefit of the again the new generation present here or uh, the next generation present here and this is a picture which is fondly called the blue marble uh, this is one of the pictures taken by the last manned motion more, uh, manned uh, mission to the moon uh, Apollo 17, and this is our home. But unfortunately, because of our indiscriminate usage, or rather misuse of various resources, we have caused very serious damage to the Earth. And perhaps many of you know that 2022 was declared by the United Nations as the International Year of Basic Sciences, 
for sustainable development. So I'll say a couple of things about that. But it is also, I'm sorry for uh, getting a part of it hidden behind it, but as you know that uh, chemical sciences is going to continue to play very major role in addressing some of the concerns, some of the problems that we created. Uh, 2022-2023, uh, United Nations has been very actively involved in uh, addressing certain goals called Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, you can get more details uh, from this website. And there are 17 Sustainable Development Goals which are to be met globally by 2030. And there are many of them here. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, and for us it is chemistry education, uh, gender equity, that is also very important in chemistry. I think globally, the number of women in chemistry are much fewer than 50%. Then the other, uh, I will not go into all these details here, but there are many of these SDGs where chemistry has to play a very, very important role. And I think as one of the major societies, chemical societies in the country, we should address some of these issues perhaps in a different way than what we have done in the past. And of course, the last, here, last one here is partnership for the goals. And we would also like to, therefore, involve our major partners, American Chemical Society, Royal Society of Chemistry, and other major, big chemical societies to address some of these issues together and hope that in the coming years, even before 2030, we can succeed. But I would also like to go back to a book written by Professor Ronald Breslow, uh, and this was published sometime in 1996. And I realized that in this book, he talks not only about the chemistry 25 years ago, or more than that, uh, chemistry of that time, but also about some future projections. And for, some, for a talk for high school kids, uh, prepared in 20, 2003, I believe, I prepared some of these points from Ron Breslow's book. And as you notice here, uh, there are many issues that relates to even today, which were listed in uh, Breslow's book. I think he was ahead of his time. Uh, and some more are listed here. But as we know very well as chemists, as practicing chemists, that we have not been able to meet many of these goals. And therefore, it's up to you to make sure that you know, some of these goals, which actually relate to sustainable usage of resources, can be met in the coming years. So with this, I would now like to go and talk very briefly in the remaining 22 minutes uh, about some of the activities that we took up uh, some years ago, uh, essentially to address a few curiosity-driven questions. I will not talk much about the details. And our work concerns a kind of a biosurfactant collectively known as bile acids or bile salts. And this was the result um, of a Nobel Prize in 1928 by Heinrich Wieland. Uh, it was discovered, the bile acids were discovered in 1848. But interestingly, the chemical structure, although he got the Nobel Prize, the chemical structure was not quite correct. The molecular formula was right, but as you can see, that there's an angular ethyl group and some other issues, ring fusion was not correct. Nevertheless, this is a correct uh, structure of the bile acid, which is one of the unusual facially amphiphilic molecules implying that one of the top, the top surface is hydrophobic and the bottom surface is hydrophilic. Without going into the details, the bile acids play very important physiological functions and uh, they enable the digestion of fat that we eat with our food. It turns out that uh, our first publication, I'm now going back a little bit in history, almost three decades ago, uh, was using the hydroxyl groups and the chirality of this molecule. And uh, about three decades later, our uh, most recent publication is on a photoluminescence assay with a portable device 
for detecting europium and terbium in, in very low concentrations. But there also the bile acid played a very important role. But for today's talk, I have chosen to take this time period, about 2012 to 2018, and talk to you about a slightly different aspect of chemistry that we did, uh, apart from this, apart from this, which perhaps may not be known to many people in the audience. And my talk is essentially going to focus to those of you who are seated in the rear two-third of this hall. So the, I, I now would like to go back more than a century. Uh, this British gentleman, Shriver, he published a paper in 1914 and 1913 showing that the sodium salt of cholic acid, the trihydroxy uh, biosurfactant, when treated with calcium, produced a clot-like material, okay, which is now known as gel. We were curious about it, and around 2010, an undergraduate intern from St. Stephen's College, Anjali, she came to my lab, and we thought that would it not be nice if this can be achieved with other metal ions? Because despite the importance of calcium in biology, calcium is a boring element for most inorganic chemists and organic chemists because it's unreactive. So we thought that can we do it with other metal ions because we wanted to do some fun things. And the idea was that if it forms a gel, then we might be able to do some chemistry on the metal ions located on the gel fibers. For example, we convert them to insoluble particles and our naive understanding was that the growing particle will be trapped in size to the dimension of the fibers, which is in tens of nanometers. So therefore, we might be able to decorate the fibrous network with insoluble nanoparticles. And of course, if this can be tuned in terms of size, in terms of properties, then you open up a lot of opportunities. The first question was, other metal ions, will they form gels? And the answer was yes. So you see some examples here. There was a paper published in 2009 by a Chinese group in Nano Letters, and thankfully we were not aware of it, otherwise we would not have done this chemistry. Uh, they used lanthanum for this purpose and did things which are different from what we ended up doing. But then the problem is, even though they form gels, you cannot do chemistry on them because the metal ion also forms, is, is part of the network. For example, we take copper cholate gel, expose it to ammonia vapor, and every inorganic chemist knows that copper forms this square planar tetramine complex, and you see the tetramine complex and the gel becomes a fluid. So you can't do chemistry on the metal ion which is actually holding the gel together. So how do you get around it? And our simple solution was with a calcium as the sort of for holding the fort gel in our case and substitute five to ten percent by the reactive metal and by doing so we were able to make for example metal sulfide nanoparticles in the respective gel uh, which is held together by the calcium network and these are examples of I think mercury um, oh, this is mercury this is probably something else maybe uh, zinc this is zinc uh, cadmium, cobalt, copper, and nickel, and many of these metal ions. We also showed that if you dope it with some of the noble metal ions, for example, gold or silver, you can make gold and silver nanoparticles. This, this is something that has been done by many people many in many different ways, so we didn't pursue much about it. But we thought that being in the Department of Organic Chemistry, we need to do some other metals which are more useful for, con con for chemical reactions. So what we did is to make a gel, calcium-based gel, with doped with palladium. I believe we used tetrachloropalladate and layered sodium cyanoborohydride solution on it. And within a few minutes, you start seeing it turning black. And after overnight, it became black. We made, we um, lyophilized it to get a palladium nanoparticle calcium colored zero gel. If you don't do this process with palladium, you get the calcium cholate zero gel, that is the dried gel, uh, um, and that is white, and this almost looks like palladium on charcoal. 
and we did a lot of analysis of it and this the average particle size was about 7 nanometers we could have we would have been better off with smaller particle sizes but then we thought that let's do some organic reactions with this uh, material and uh, what we did is to try out what else but suzuki tight couplings uh, i will not show the substrate scope and all that but basically what we also showed that the product had very little amount of palladium leached into it, less than two parts per billion. This was done by ICPOES technique. Uh, we also showed that you can use the bromide, but you need a little more uh, palladium. Notice here that the palladium quantity in terms of gram atom percentage, not mole percent, was about 0 0.07, which is fairly low loading. And we also showed that you can do Sonogashira type couplings here. And we were curious to see whether this material can be recycled. And we showed that you can take, in fact, an aqueous suspension of this catalyst, carry out the reaction by adding the substrates, extract with ether, add more substrate, and this cycle can go on for about four cycles. And the yield drops towards the end, so we were curious to know what happens to the catalyst as you are going through the cycles. So the, uh, and then we also showed that in the water, there was less than one parts per billion uh, of palladium. So there was no leaching out of palladium, which is often uh, a problem uh, in, in our system. Uh, so this is how the zero gel looks like, but the one that we isolated of the first cycle and looked under TEM, uh, SEM first, it looked kind of interesting. And those of you who are familiar with uh, crystals, a structure of crystals, not crystal structure, our shape of crystals would recognize that this is a very characteristic of calcite, calcium carbonate crystal, which you see here. That's a big, big crystal. And of course, we realize that if you have calcium salt in your catalyst and you're carrying out the reaction in potassium carbonate, of course you are going to get calcite. So what really happens of the first cycle is that the palladium nanoparticles aggregate to some extent but they are now no longer in a calcium cholate medium, but in a calcium carbonate medium. But it still remains active. So we didn't pursue it further, but it's quite possible that we might be able to find ways to make it more efficient, growing smaller nanoparticles, and so on. Let me quickly show you another area that we uh, gotten into, and that was uh, triggered by some publications of uh, Frank Van Wegel uh, from Canada, and what he did is to make lanthanum fluoride nanoparticles uh, for basically for imaging purpose. And these are some of the publications, uh, pictures from the publications of the lanthanide fluoride nanoparticles published by Van Wegel. And we thought that since in our case we found the lanthanides also form gels, can we not make the lanthanide nanoparticles? by diffusing in fluoride into the gels. So by doing controlled, uh, doing it in a controlled way, this was done by my student um, Tumpa Gorai. What Tumpa found is that indeed you can get beautiful lanthanide fluoride nanoparticles made at room temperature. Van Wegel made it by high temperature processes. Uh, this is uh, terbium, gadolinium, uh, neodymium, and we in fact completed the entire lanthanide series um, and showed that you can indeed make uh, beautiful uh, lanthanide fluoride nanoparticles by this technique. Um, another interesting thing that happened at that time is that in addition to the trihydroxy derivative, we also use the sodium deoxycholate, which has one less hydroxy. And my student Arkajoti Chakraborty found at that time is that in methanol, it forms a very nice precipitate of cadmium deoxycholate. And we were interested this as to use as a potential source of cadmium for making cadmium related nanoparticles. It turns out cadmium oxide or cadmium myristate are used for this purpose. But what we found is that despite having the hydroxyl group, the cadmium deoxycholate was thermally stable by 100 degrees over and above cadmium myristate. Doesn't quite make sense chemically, but it does. It, this, is, this is how it is. So what Orco did was to use the standard ways of making cadmium selenide nanoparticles using cadmium uh, deoxycholate as the precursor. And all this characterization and other details I will skip. 
But what he showed is that he is, yes, indeed, by controlling the time of growth, which is very standard for uh, people who make cadmium selenide nanoparticles, you can indeed use, uh, you can indeed make, you know, the entire spectrum uh, of uh, emission from the cadmium selenide nanoparticles by controlling the size. Uh, he was also able to make uh, one of the other students, Sayantan Chatterjee, uh, he was also sh able to show that you can indeed make uh, cadmium sulfide nanoparticles in situ at room temperature by diffusing in sulfide into a cadmium doped calcium collar gel and the nanoparticles are nicely uh, organized. This is not the best TM we obtained, but I'm using an old slide. Uh, or, uh, they are all oriented on the, on the fibers in a predictable manner. Uh, at that time, we had a Safipra project, Indo-French project, and along with uh, the collaborators Cyril Amonier um, and, uh, and Samuel Marais and uh, uh, André Del Guerzo, what we also showed, uh, again, this was work done by, uh, by uh, Scienton, and uh, what he showed is that by a flow process using supercritical hexane, you can grow beautiful nano rods and nanocrystals of cadmium selenide using our precursor, cadmium deoxycolate, uh, by this process and at temperatures between 250 and 310 degrees centigrade. And this produced, again, the entire um, spectrum of nanoparticles, uh, giving uh, you know, different kinds of emission and, um, and a very simple way to make nanoparticles, provided you have this kind of a supercritical hexane setup. And this we are now trying to pursue in a new, um, uh, new um, Cephipra project with the same collaborators to uh, measure the kinetics of these processes because we would like to know how you can grow and how these materials actually form the nanoparticles. So Santan was also able to show subsequently, uh, Santan and uh, Arkojoti, that by mixing the precursors cadmium and zinc and using both selenium and sulfur source, top C and top tops, you can make core shell type of nanoparticles. Again, I will not go into those details, but these were all high quality uh, nanoparticles that were formed. We were also curious because, you know, most of these cadmium selenide nanoparticles are made by high temperature processes uh, exceeding 250 degrees. So we were curious whether these can be made at room temperature. Again, there was nothing known at that time. So what we thought is that can we make a cadmium collate gel and diffuse in a soluble sulfide, selenide source. And indeed, what uh, Arko Jyoti showed, uh, or Santan showed in this particular case, is that you can, in fact, make uh, cadmium selenide, yellow emitting cadmium selenide nanoparticle by a very simple process. And we showed that you can make, in fact, macroscopic uh, quantities of this yellow emitting, this is a uh, fluorescence image, uh, just taken under the UV lamp, uh, TLC UV lamp, very low tech uh, imaging. Uh, and this is the solid state uh, photoluminescence shown. And we were also able to redisperse by changing the capping ligand uh, from uh, water soluble to water insoluble type of ligands. We were able to make uh, a green emitting nanoparticle which was soluble in toluene and chloroform. A couple of other things that I would like to highlight here is that uh, uh, Arko Jyoti, in, in fact, in this case, and another student of mine, Mithasri, uh, they also spent some time, uh, both of them spent some time with my French collaborators, and what they showed is that this nanofiber directed, in this case it was an organogel, and in which they made this cadmium sulf zinc sulfide cadmium selenide nano rods, and these nano rods were very nicely oriented on the fibers, and they, ex they showed this thing by using lifetime imaging, and very beautiful images, and that showed that how this things, these particles, these nano rods were oriented on the gel fibers. Um, I would just like to mention very briefly about some work done by my student Bala Murugan, and he uh, used a different technique, but he made uh, gold and copper derived uh, nano clusters and uh, looked at the luminescence, organized them in a, in a metallohydrogel and he showed that one can detect, for example, uh, lead ions by a luminescence quenching technique. So basically the uh, fluorescence or luminescence of the nanocluster gets quenched selectively by lead ions, and we were able to detect sub 
parts per million uh, quantities of lead by this process. So I would not, again, like to go into the technical uh, details of this, but uh, I would like to finish off by showing you something that was a bit unexpected. And this is uh, preparing manganese dioxide nano flowers. So, so what I'm presenting today is kind of a mix of organic and inorganic uh, chemistry that we, as I said, that was more of an exploratory work for us. And this was, in fact, we were trying to make manganese dioxide nanoparticles in the gel, but it turns out that the best way that Ajay Kumar uh, found is that the bile salt has easily oxidizable secondary hydroxyl group. So by using a solvothermal kind of a process, uh, taking permanganate in, uh, in a bile salt solution uh, at about 190 degrees under some pressure, he was able to generate these beautiful uh, manganese dioxide nano flowers, uh, and we characterized them by all the standard processes, and they're fairly large surface area. I, I think it was several hundred uh, uh, square meters per gram. And naturally, these we felt that this will be very reactive. And a couple of things that we did, one is to do a very standard dye absorption studies, and that worked pretty well. I think this is a very standard uh, dye absorption people show in test tube, <laughs> not in real life, uh, using methylene blue, uh, which worked pretty well. And again, as I said, that I work in the Department of Organic Chemistry, so it is almost mandatory at times to do some organic chemistry. And we showed that this manganese dioxide was in fact very reactive manganese dioxide and was able to oxidize uh, secondary uh, allylic alcohol and benzylic alcohol uh, much better than the commercial manganese dioxide that you get. Uh, so this technique uh, of Ajay actually generates very, very large surface area manganese dioxide. And if any of you um, would be interested in this, we will certainly be happy to share our method of preparation and share some of these particles with it. But Ajay went one step further because we have a colleague, Aninda, Professor Aninda Bhattacharya, who is interested in energy and battery technologies and electrode surfaces, uh, battery materials. So he collaborated with them uh, and uh, he showed that this, these nanoflowers were, could be used in, as electrodes for symmetrical supercapacitors. And this was published uh, last year, I think, in, in a specialized uh, electrochemistry journal. So this is the last example that I thought I would share with you. We haven't done any detailed investigation on, uh, on it further, uh, on any of these nanoparticles, but one of the interests that we have now is just like manganese dioxide, you can also take per ruthenate and reduce it to ruthenium dioxide, which can be used as a catalyst for certain types of reactions. And we have demonstrated that you can do it. You get beautiful nanoparticles, I believe about five, six, seven nanometer diameter. And that is something that we would like to pursue in the coming years. So with this, let me just uh, make a summary that uh, in spite of our uh, activities in using the um, chirality of this molecule and its ability to form gels. In between, we ventured into a different area, made uh, inorganic, organic hybrids, and I hope that in the coming years, we will find new usage for some of these materials that we have prepared, and perhaps we can get some more people interested in exploring things that we have not been able to explore. So with this, uh, my time is running out, so I would like to conclude um, and uh, once again, uh, thank all of you for uh, hosting us here, uh, Professor Rao, uh, Professor Dinda, and others. And once again, I welcome all the participants, speakers, uh, guests, and uh, poster presenters to this meeting. And I do hope that you will enjoy the next two and a half days of science here. And please do ask questions and um, interact with all of us. You know, CRSI is very informal in nature. Uh, so if you have questions about CRSI, if you have questions about ACS, you know, we are all here to discuss, to chat, uh, even if it is not related to any research topic about curriculum, we will be more than happy because one of the um, missions of CRSI is also to promote quality chemistry education. So we would like to see that we have intense discussion and uh, very, very, you know, fruitful uh, stay here. Uh, I must also say before that 52nd minute becomes, second becomes zero, 
is that 2023 is the International Year of Millets. Right? And I have requested Professor Dinda to make sure that uh, at least one uh, main course of dessert tonight or tomorrow night is made from a millet locally available from Odisha. That will be our acknowledgement of the IYM 2023, and I am sure that we will all enjoy whatever has been planned. Thank you again very much. Thank you so much, sir. That was a very thought-provoking address that set a platform for the upcoming sessions. Now, I would like to uh, request our audience, if they have any questions, to please go forward. Uh, now I would like to request our convener, Professor Rupam Dinda, to kindly felicitate Professor Uday Metra, President of CRSI. I would also like to request uh, Professor Maitra to kindly felicitate our Honorable Director, sir. So if you could kindly come on stage. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, let us break for the tea and reassemble after 25 minutes to com commence our first technical session, which would be the CRSI ACS lecture. Thank you all. <laughs>